Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for Blue Water Cruising Association for hosting this event. Your alternator output is connected over a very tiny wire for three feet to the starter solenoid post. In turn, that starter solenoid post is connected to an on-off battery switch. And in turn, that battery switch is connected to a battery. This could be an off one, all, both, two switch. Doesn't matter. Believe it or not, a lot of boats that have been MacGyvered, people thought the switches were hassles and they removed them. A lot of engines are unswitched now. They're like, well, why would I have a battery switch when I can just turn the engine on or off of the key? It's a good idea until you have a stuck starter and you can't turn off your starter from keeping starting and your boat catches on fire. And that happens, by the way, every summer here, all the time. I get called in for that stuff for surveys all the time. Stuck starters are not a mystical unicorn that we've never seen but only imagine. It's a real thing. They do happen. And if you don't have an on-off battery switch, the only way of doing it would be disconnecting the wire here or there. And when there's smoke in your engine room, the least likely probability is for someone to go down in the engine room with a wrench and be blinded and find the battery and disconnect the right wire. And generally what happens is the hatch gets closed back and they're like, and this was fun. Let's get into the dinghy and let's get out of here. So your alternator is connected right to that post right here. Um, and if it's an internal regulator, and we'll talk about external regulators right now, honestly, it's an on-off thing. What you're generally worried about, and, and, and this happens 95% of the time, so it's going to make troubleshooting an alternator easy. 98% of the time, the alternator burned out. It's that simple. Nothing else. It's not external. This wire never fails. You could have turned that battery switch off when the alternator is running and you broke the alternator. And IE broke means you need to bring it back to the shop to have it fixed. But honestly, when an alternator isn't working, 99% of the time, it's the alternator died. And the alternator died because alternators live in very warm environments. They're asked to do too much because our battery banks are huge compared to a car, and we're asking them to do way too much work, and they're undersized for the battery bank that we put in, and they're working at full capacity for way too long, and it's super hot engine room, and they end up overheating and burning out. So troubleshooting an alternator is pretty straightforward because realistically, you're not really looking at anything other than if my alternator is working or not. And if it's not working, the way to know that is to, and I talked about this earlier to a few people, you are not connected to shore power because you don't want your battery charger to be working. You turn, your, turn the key on on the ignition, but you don't actually start the engine. You just see what your battery voltage is. And your battery voltage might say 12.6, might say 12.8, 12.4, it doesn't matter. It says some sort of voltage. You start your engine, battery voltage is going to drop. 10.5, 10 volts, 9.5 volts, because you're starting. And then you're going to let go of the button or the key because it's a momentary thing, right? A starter is a momentary button. And then suddenly the voltage is going to start rising back up from 10.5 or 9.5 and it's going to get close, you know, over time, even if you didn't have an alternator, the battery voltage would go slowly back to 12.6 or where you started. Maybe make it 0.1 less, but it's not going to kill a battery to start an engine, especially if your engine started relatively well. So you're going to get back to around 12.4, 12.6 and maybe 30 seconds later, as long as your engine is sorely not at idle. Some alternators work at idle, but not all. You want to be about 1200, 1400 RPM. You could be not in gear, but you need to rev up. 13, about 12, 1400 RPM, then they're pretty much all kicking at that point. You turn it on, or you rev up, and now you should see your battery voltage go above where you started. And if the battery voltage does not go from where you were at the beginning before starting your engine, Let's say you're at 12.5 and it never goes above 12.5, your alternator is done. It's done. It's finished. Black and white. It's over. There's nothing else to it. You're done. Especially if you're 99% of the people that have this. Now, if you're one of the few people that have rewired their alternator, the house battery, and your engine battery only gets a charge through an ACR, then yes, it's more complicated. But 99% of us have this. So unless your boat is sort of custom, 
I've touched it or someone knows what they're doing touched it or you're a pro and you touched it, pretty much all of us have this setup. This setup here is pretty rare. Is that a better setup? Question is, is that a better setup? Yes, this is a much better setup. Why? Because it's a better setup because it's better to have a high output alternator connected to a house battery and not go through an on-off switch. This is not a, it's not just an opinion. I mean, it's Nigel Calder's, I mean, everyone agrees. It's just, it's more wiring because then you have a large wire going to your starter and you have a large wire going to your alternator. That's two large wires. And people that build boats aren't dreamers, they're accountants. And if you're not an accountant and you're a boat builder, you're not gonna be there for long. It's, it's an expensive business. And if you don't count dollars, then you're not gonna be in business. So. Boat builders are businesses, they're not just dreamers. And so that's why they end up doing one wire that does two things. And notice that's why there's bi-directional arrows. When you start, you pull. Once the engine is started, it pushes back, right? So it pulls to start the engine, and as soon as the alternator is on, then it goes back to the battery. Hence why all these are directional arrows. Here, the alternator never pulls really, it only pushes, right? So it pushes current back into the battery. But that battery is rarely the engine battery because the engine battery doesn't need a charge. The engine battery needs a little bit of a charge and it's gonna get it through an echo charge, a combiner, or something like that. And that's where sometimes it's not as simple to troubleshoot the custom because the custom needs a better understanding of the system. But luckily, 99% of us have this, so it doesn't matter. Now, if I've been on your boat, 90% of you have this. Don't do it for everyone, depends. But if I'm going to touch your alternator, guaranteed I'm going to do this. The ACR would hook up right here on that battery and it would, the ACR would be in the middle and then you'd have an ACR in between the two batteries. Okay. okay, but remember ACRs are not great for everything. They also give you a problem. If you have a custom setup, there's still a battery switch between the battery and the starter solenoid, as there should be. By the way, at least 20% of you don't have that because the owner thought it was stupid. No joke. Um, you, you should have a battery switch between a starter and a starter solenoid. Bat between a starter battery and a starter solenoid. You should have a battery switch. You can have your alternator directly connected to the battery via fuse, bypassing the switch because, we talked about it, alternator, goes to unswitched distribution. Yeah. yeah, question was, unrelated troubleshooting, is there any correlation between an inboard outboard for a 350 engine? Um, a 350 engine is gonna out, it's, it's gonna always be this, 100%, never this. You can't really change it. Oh, yeah, it's always this. And um, like for example, I know the Mercury outputs about 350, about, 30 amps of output of alternator, up to 40 amps of alternator output at reasonable speeds. So they're, they're, they're putting bigger and bigger alternators on all boards, they know that. There's even like, uh, I think Evinrude has huge outputs now on even smaller engines, like 100, 100 horsepower, 125 horsepower engines. It depends on the spec you have to read. But yeah, they're, they're, they're now inclined, outboard manufacturers are inclined to put larger and larger alternators than just smaller. In the past, they were pretty small on outboards. They didn't think they needed it, but they realize now that outboards drive big boats too, yeah. right? As we know, there's no limit now. Well, there is, but there's, you can have pretty big boats with just outboards, and so it's an option now to have pretty big alternators. And you can have a really reasonable alternator on an outboard as you would with an inboard engine. Short answer, yes. Question was, is it a good idea if you've got an alternator in an engine room and it's pretty warm to put a blower to blow air in or out? And absolutely, on my boat I did it. I run my blower every time I turn my engine on. Every single time. I, I take the air out uh, because there's air, cool air pretty much everywhere and I'm sucking. I literally have the intake of the air is right behind the alternator. Like I have it within six inches. I suck warm air out of there all the time. And then cold air comes from everywhere around the boat.
and it's not colder outside than inside. So I take the warm air out of the boat. There's cold air everywhere inside the boat. It's not really warmer or colder inside or outside. The engine room is hot. So I remove warm air out from the engine room to keep my alternator cool, to try to maximize the life of my alternator. When you have your boat and you are connected to shore power, should you have your shore power be on when you start your engine and is it okay if you are or not? Correct? Yeah, plugged on. Yeah, yeah. You, it's a little bit like having your battery switch and I, you know, it's funny, you gotta be really careful and I've had the same problem. I also thought the same thing before. When I got my boat, I was like, well, why does it matter? It matters because what happens is a battery charger should not be helping your battery start your engine. That'd be one of the first reasons. Again, back to the point I said yesterday, there's no place to know that your engine battery doesn't start your engine on its own without a battery charger, right? Like, if, for example, if I need help getting out of a chair, right, I want to know that right away. I don't want to always have help getting out of a chair. If I can't get out of a chair myself, I'm going to ask myself why. And if you have your battery charger at the dock charging your engine battery, when you're starting your engine, your charger is going to help charge, run that engine or start it. And the problem is when you're back somewhere at an anchorage in the middle of nowhere, your battery charger is not there to help. So it happens a lot that people run their engine, start it at the dock, and it, it's okay, it's not great, but they don't notice. Hey, but they're leaving. They want to go. They get to a destination, now they go to start the engine, and it's not enough. Because sometimes you're only 10, 20% off from not being able to start your engine. And if the charger is enabled, you won't know that you're not good enough on your own. So that'd be one of the reasons. The second reason is also that a battery charger is basically helping to run the batteries to charge them. And a starter puts a crazy load. And the moment that you press the starter solenoid and you're starting to crank over, and it's, maybe it's a slow start, two seconds, three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, your charger sees that and says, I gotta help. This is all hands on deck. I don't know what's going on with the battery voltage, but we gotta do something. And so then the charger starts pumping 40 amps, 50 amps, 100 amps, 150 amps into that battery. And then when you disc stop suddenly, like suddenly you take the moment, you take your finger off that starter key or momentary on, suddenly the loads are gone. The charger doesn't have time to react as quickly as you did the moment that momentary on. What it causes is a voltage spike. Because the charger is not an instantaneous device. There's no such thing as instantaneous. There is a reaction time to everything. And that reaction time could be, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. But 0.1 of a second is still too long if suddenly you had a battery bank that was pretty good shape, you're pumping 150 amp on it thinking it's dead, but it's only dead because you started an engine, suddenly the 600 amp load or 400 amp load or 300 amp load is gone, and then suddenly the charger doesn't react as quickly as you disconnecting the load from it, and the voltage spike goes up. And when you have a voltage spike, you have problems. So those are two good reasons for why never starting your engine when connected to shore power. And having, your short, and having your charger enabled and charging the very battery that you're starting the engine from. Okay, we're gonna talk about this one as intimidating as it should. This is an external regulator and it's related to alternators. This is probably one of the most difficult things to troubleshoot on a boat. If you have an external regulator on your boat, you need to truly understand how it works to troubleshoot it. It can be haphazard. It's probably one of the, we get more alternator regulator service calls from other businesses than even clients. A lot of businesses don't even know how to solve this problem. I get calls from builders, from other businesses that would call us in to solve this problem. That's how hard this problem is. They don't call us in to solve any type of problem. This is, they're above their pay grade at this point. And that is not the alternator itself, but the alternator doesn't work and it has and it's connected to an external regulator. And you can see the number of wires that are connected to this device to give it the magic that we talked about, right? This is a magical device. It's an incredible device. I do probably uh, hundreds a year 
It's awesome. We'll do maybe two a week, three a week in the summer, four a week, five a week. There's nothing wrong about this device, but you have to understand how it works to troubleshoot it. So let's talk about the things that you need for this to work. First of all, you absolutely have to have power coming into this, right? So the power is going to come right here, coming down. It, can, it shouldn't come from the alternator itself, but a lot of people take shortcuts and are going to connect it to the back of the alternator. You shouldn't do that, but some people are going to do that. It should come from the battery. That's the first thing. If it doesn't get power, if your TV is not plugged in the wall, it's never going to turn on. First step, you got to have power. Second step, this device will not turn on unless it receives ignition power. That's actually like pushing the TV or the microwave and pressing on. If you don't have ignition power and your ignition key is not on, this thing will never turn on because this only turns on if the ignition key is on and if it's wired properly. Next thing. This then has power coming in. It has, it's been told to turn on. And this has a brain and over a period, after about, I don't know, a minute, some amount of time, it's going to say, okay, we're ready. Because it doesn't want to load the alternator at the right moment when it starts. It's going to wait about a minute. Or there's a sort of a timer. It's going to say, we're going to wait about a minute until the engine sort of running smoothly. And then we're going to load up the alternator. And it does that by the fuel voltage. And the fuel voltage is really what our foot does on an actuator driving our car. Our foot doesn't move a mile to make a car go from zero to 100 miles an hour. It moves an inch. And that inch is the difference between going dead slow or stop to full throttle, right? That's what it is. That fuel voltage is what actually drives your alternator. That's what it does. And that fuel voltage is not coincidentally in blue, and that's how they want it. Balmar wants it in blue. And that's what drives that alternator. In turn, that alternator will send then attack output back to here. And that's how your RPM gauge on some engines. Some engines take RPM from the flywheel. Some of them take them from the alternator. It's way better to have it from the flywheel, but a lot of us get the alternator or the RPM of the engine from the alternator rotation. And they actually get tacked from an alternator. And the other thing that can happen is if ever, and I've had that, I troubleshoot this problem this summer, we had a client that was complaining of his alternator uh, working intermittently. But what was happening is the V-belt was not properly tightened and the alternator was overheating. Remember, we talked about that yesterday. If you rub two hands together, you're going to warm up, right? Imagine rubbing, but like at, you know, remember this alternator, the pulley ratio might be rotating 8,000 RPMs a minute, right? Your engine's rotating at 2,100, 2,500 RPM. The ratio is might be 2.7. So maybe it's rotating at 6,000, 7,000 RPMs a minute. If it's slipping, that's a hell of a lot of slippage. And so that slippage, belt slippage, causes the, the alternator to overheat, in part. Or if it's working too hard and it's being asked to charge a completely depleted battery bank as a function of its size, if that alternator is too small for a battery bank, it's going to work too hard, right? And so after a few hours of leaving the dock, guess what would happen? The alternator temperature sensor would come in here and it would say the alternator is too hot and it would throttle back on the field. It would be like a limiter on a car saying, you know what? You know, I should have had a limiter on my car when I was growing up, when I was bringing my parents' car. I should not have been able to go above 80 kilometers an hour. I should have been dead slow zone. But my parents didn't have that, so I went full throttle. And the fuel voltage is basically then throttled on the alternator when it senses your alternator temperature sensor senses that the alternator is too warm. And it can also do that. It can correct for battery voltage. But it, it can also overcorrect, well, not overcorrect, but say, hey, you know what? The battery is now way too warm. We need to throttle output as well. Let's say you've got a really big alternator, a small battery bank. This battery might, must overheat. It's like eating too fast too quickly, right? We overheat too, right? You can't, you got to pace yourself, right? And so what happens is this battery gets warm and then it senses and it sends a code to this device and it says, you know what? Battery temperature is too warm. Throttle back on the field voltage. And that is how an external regulator works. External regulators are great. Everybody wants one, every single person. The only reason you wouldn't do it is because like most of us, we have limited funds. That's the only reason. Besides money, there's no downside to this device. What's the cost? About in Canadian dollars, about $600. Yeah. There's no downside to this device other than cost. And cost is a pretty damn good reason. But it's, there's no like technical downside to an external regulator.
So the, the power from this alternator, this is very interesting. You got, you got a large cable coming down. You can take the power tap right from this post right here, or you could take this power all the way back right here at the battery. You see that? So there's two wires. Power comes from the battery all the way here and then all the way back here, or you could have the power wire of this come all the way back to the battery. Well, no, it's, it's like a starter solenoid. It's okay. powered at the beginning, before the alternator starts, by the battery. The moment the alternator starts, it's then powered by the alternator. So the question was, is my regulator powered by the alternator or the battery? Well, before it starts, it's powered by the battery. The moment the alternator starts, then it's powered by the alternator. Because the alternator is higher voltage than the battery, and hence the alternator is running the gear. Okay, it's complicated. What you would do is you remove variables, right? So when I start troubleshooting one of those, what do I say? I say, okay, you know what? Make sure your alternator temperature sensor is not shorted or your battery temperature sensor is not shorted. Let's remove them from the device. Let's remove those from the device. Because solving a multivariable equation is hard. So the best approach to solve multivariable equation is to remove variables, right? First step, remove that battery temperature sensor, remove that alternator temperature sensor. Next, make sure there's power coming to that device, right, coming from the battery. If you've got power there, then measure the ignition wire. Make sure there's ignition power coming down. If it, that's energized and lights up, once it's turned on after about a minute, make sure that you see a vol fuel voltage. If you see a fuel voltage and this doesn't turn on, then you know the problem is inside the alternator. And that's how you troubleshoot that. Not too hard when I say it, but... Yeah, question in the back. It, the question would be how much field voltage do you have in the wire? Full field means full battery voltage, which means maximum output of the alternator. And then anything from that, it could be 5 volts, 6 volts, 8 volts. A fraction of full field is going to make that alternator work at a fraction of full output, as it should as it gets near the top. Right? Same thing when we on ramp, imagine Autobahn, full throttle. You're trying to get to 300 kilometers an hour. Never driven, but I can only imagine how fun it would be. 300 kilometers an hour, you're like full acceleration. It'd be like incredible. But at one point, once you get close to 300, you start to got to throw it back, right? You're not going full acceleration to 300 and then stop. You're going to throttle back as you get to 300, right? You're going to pull back on the actuator. And that's what that field voltage does. Because remember, this is a, effectively makes an alternator a smart charger. It goes through bulk absorption float. The question would be, how foolproof or reliable is an external regulator? I'd say 15, 20 years. It's, it's pretty much, like I never replaced them, unless they got flooded. But then, I mean, there's other problems. The alternator is getting changed too, and you know, it's, it's pretty reliable. Yes, at the back. Uh, alternator. If the alternator, the question is, what happens is if this blows while the alternator is running? If this fuse blows or is turned off when the alternator is running? And if you don't have a Scotty diode in the back of this alternator, which is a Balmar product, you'll blow up your alternator. You can't ever, 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 black and white, stop a car with a wall. You can do it, absolutely. Yeah, your car will stop, guaranteed. It will stop, but you do not have a car no more. You have a wreck, and this would become a wreck. You can't stop current by disconnecting it from the battery. It's that moment will destroy the alternator. And I've done that, by the way. I did that. I remember exactly. It was about mid-May 2006. And I blew up my alternator. Hence me being here today. Yeah. Question? The field voltage, when it gets throttled back, the alternator output throttles back. A good way to stop an alternator from outputting would be to cut back the field voltage altogether. Disconnect the field voltage, the alternator doesn't work. You don't damage the alternator, and that's completely fine. But you cannot disconnect an alternator output on the output. You can disconnect an alternator from outputting by disconnecting the field voltage, but you cannot disconnect an alternator from outputting by disconnecting the output. You can stop an input, but you can't stop an output. Does that make sense? Hey, nailed it. I wasn't sure about that one. OK, all right. Another question in the back. Yeah, and you're right. On the point is that was brought up is some boats you need to pull a cable to kill the air to emit diesel and some boats you press a button 
but I think the button is just a version of there's a little lever there that's activated electrically to shut the air to the diesel. You shut air to a diesel, you kill the diesel.